Hey, I'm Carl Willis. I'm on the faculty here in the Nuclear Engineering Department at the University of New Mexico, and also I'm the Public Information and Outreach Officer for the Trinity Section of the American Nuclear Society. Today, we're going to look at radioactive stuff making things glow, which is one of my favorite sites in the whole world. Um, but it's also a very useful thing for industrial radiation detection and measurement and medical technologies such as PET scanners that use the light produced when radiation interacts with stuff. So we're going to be looking at scintillators today. We've got a bunch of scintillation materials set up in the source closet and we're going to go to the very back of the room, pull out a really hot source. We're talking about a tenth of a curie of uh, cesium-137 and let that radiation bathe those scintillators in high energy gamma radiation. And then we're going to take a long exposure photo and show you just what colors come out of those materials. So it should be fun, but there's a couple technical elements. First of all, we want to make sure we don't get overexposed. So I've got some toys from Costco to help me manipulate the source so that I can stay away from it. So we've got our uh, distance component. You'll see when we get in there, we've also got shielding set up and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, we're also going to be very quick with what we're doing. So time distance shielding, we're gonna stay safe. I don't expect to get any measurable dose from this activity despite the fact that we have a high activity source in use. So let's go take a look. I think we'll get some really cool, beautiful photos. Thanks for watching. All righty, so the first thing I'm gonna point out, we've already got our experiment staged. All of our scintillation materials are set up on this piece of glass, and there's a bunch of lead here, which is designed to keep the radiation going up into the materials of interest and not out towards me. Um, we've also got a camera, if you wanna uh, show us, uh, which is shielded with lead, and hopefully it'll be enough to keep the noise down in the camera, but we're gonna, uh, take a long exposure. So this camera is already staged and set up and ready to go. We've got a um, survey meter here. It's on a high range. So I can see what my dose rates are when I go to uh, start the experiment. And what I want to do, I want to take the source out of its storage location here. I'm going to turn it upright and then I'm going to move it uh, directly under the scintillating materials. And some of these things are easier said than done. The source could flip over, um, you know, but I'm prepared for that. I've, uh, I'm, I know what it looks like, feels like, and, and I'm prepared for that. So let me get this camera set up. Timer. Self-timer, there it is. It always turns off on this particular camera, so I'm gonna set it to 10 seconds. I've got a good view in there. I've got my I've got it on the bulb setting and I've got my shutter ready to go. So everything is good except for the source. So now we're going to take our source out. And the first thing we'll do is just get it out and then we're going to make sure we get it oriented correctly. So here's our source. That's a nice hot cesium source. And we're just going to work it over this way. Stand it up. I'm going to grab it at the bottom. We're gonna move it where it needs to go, which is all the way back in here. All righty, source is in place. I'm gonna check the radiation level where my camera is because I don't want the camera to go postal. And uh, looks to me like right near the camera, we've got maybe 20 or so milliroentgen per hour. All righty. So we're ready for this picture. Guys, you ready to get the lights? Okay. So I'm gonna back out quick, okay? Eight, seven, six. Let's get the lights off, guys. Awesome. Okay, let's see what happens. Well, folks, here it is, the picture we've been waiting for. As you can see, the scintillation materials exhibit a wide diversity of colors and brightnesses, and although the picture doesn't show it, also in their response times to radiation events. 
Each of these materials produces a little flash of light when it's hit by a discrete gamma ray, and what you're seeing is the integrated totality of millions of these little scintillation events. Let's talk about some of these materials and where they're used. So over here in the can, to protect it from air, is sodium iodide, one of the most widely used scintillation materials. You'll find sodium iodide being used for portable gamma spectroscopy in uh, law enforcement applications, environmental assessments, and radiological surveys in workplaces where radioactive material is used. It's truly the workhorse of the industry, and it's manufactured in large quantities. As you can see, the light it produces is a beautiful blue color. Plastic scintillators are another common choice that you find in portable equipment. It's mass producible, it's inexpensive, and it has a, uh, a similar composition to human tissue, and so it has what's called a tissue equivalent response. And that's useful in, in survey instruments as well, and here's an example that we have in the uh, UNM laboratories being used as a survey meter with tissue proportional response. The very brightest scintillator in this lineup is thallium-doped cesium iodide. And as you can see, it produces a brilliant yellowish-green light. This material is not as useful as sodium iodide because that color is not as good for the photomultiplier tubes that are typically used in equipment. So this, this sodium iodide, despite being not quite as bright, uh, actually puts more signal into photomultiplier tubes. But there are other technologies that are emerging, um, solid state uh, photomultipliers and things like that, for which cesium iodide is a better match. And so we're seeing more instruments being made with cesium iodide, particularly very compact dosimeters and things like that. I have three examples in here of materials that are used in detectors for positron emission tomography, or PET scans. This medical technique allows us to image the functional and metabolic behavior of individual organs in the body. So we have yttrium silicate, lutetium-doped yttrium silicate, and bismuth germinate. All three of these are dense, bright materials that emit in the blue-green and are very effective for PET scanners. So if you ever have to get a PET scan, you can thank these materials for making the technique work reliably. Here we have an example of a material that emits very little light. In fact, it looks just like a piece of inert glass in the photo. But this is extremely valuable in certain physics research because it is the fastest responding material of all of these scintillators. This is barium fluoride, and although you can't see much light coming from it, it is a uh, producer of ultraviolet and dark purple light, and not very much light, but it is extremely fast. It has time resolution below one nanosecond. And this is very useful if you want to look at the coincidence of radiation events or the time of flight of radiation in an experiment. Similarly, we have a piece of lead tungstate over here on the very far left, and this material also is not bright. It looks just like a big chunk of glass. You can't see any light coming out of it in the photo, but this has enabled some of the most pivotal high-energy physics discoveries of the last century. This material is used in ton quantities in detectors at CERN and has been used to help discover the Higgs boson. And it doesn't need to be a very bright scintillator because it's looking for extremely high energy events where particles deposit a large amount of energy over the entire bulk of a massive multi-ton quantity of the material. At the bottom here, I have a bundle of scintillation fibers. And you can't see much light being given off by them, but they have an extremely valuable property, which is that they can localize the source of radiation spatially very well. You can have a bundle of these fibers and know exactly where the radiation interaction took place. That's extremely important in certain imaging applications. Most of these materials emit in the blue-green end of the spectrum, the short wavelength end of the electromagnetic spectrum, but um, that doesn't mean we can't have materials that emit in the red, and so I have two examples here of those. 
We've got mercurous bromide, which is an experimental material that emits heavily in the infrared and red. And we have um, yttrium oxysulfide with a europium dopant and a, in a powder form that emits red light. And unlike large solid crystals, the powder is not very good at transmitting the light that, it's, that is being produced in it, so it has more limited applications. Finally, I have included a piece of yttrium orthovanidate in this lineup. It has no known applications yet as a scintillation detector, but I've observed that it produces scintillation light that is not dissimilar in color to that from the cesium iodide, so I decided to show off a piece of it here. And my larger point in doing that is to say that scintillation detector research is an ongoing frontier in nuclear engineering. New materials are constantly being developed to serve application spaces in medicine and industry and law enforcement and basic science. And this is a great field of study. So if you like seeing stuff glow and you're interested in the properties of stuff that glows when radiation hits it, this is a very fruitful area to get into, and I encourage you to come study nuclear engineering and be part of that ongoing revolution. With all that said, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this picture as much as I enjoyed taking it. And if you're interested in further activities having to do with Nuclear Science Week, please see the link up in the uh, screen. And if you're interested in joining the Trinity section of the American Nuclear Society, I would love to have your input. Again, please follow the link up above. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you in another video. So now comes the fun part. We get to get the source out of where it is, put it back in its storage container. So hopefully we can execute this mission with, uh, with success. But this will be a real test of my skills using the the thing there we go okay sources back home and uh, we have successfully performed this experiment now we have to do the now we get to do the fun part and go look at the pictures we took which hopefully will be nice but um, one thing I'll point out right away a fair bit of radiation in the course of a 10 minute shot is going to get on the sensor of that camera. So we're probably going to see some, some sparkles in there, but uh, we'll see what we get. <laughs>